Friends, this is Carl Scott. This program is on tobacco. We in North Carolina are concerned, and rightly so, over the plight of the tobacco industry. The industry is in a revolution. This revolution was set off by the lung cancer scare. I mean talk of cigarettes causing cancer. The cancer scare made people go to filter cigarettes. Right or wrong, this has compelled farmers to make drastic changes in the kind of tobacco they grow. Since the days of Sir Walter Raleigh, tobacco has been North Carolina's number one crop. It has been and still is the, the backbone of our farm economy. But things have been changing. In the past three years alone, North Carolina farmers have lost $350 million because of reduced tobacco production. Acreage allotments have been cut time and time again. This year, tobacco acreage in North Carolina will be about 65% of what it was only three years ago. This year, 1958, is the critical year. If we get through this year, there are bright years, days ahead. Farmers and the tobacco industry in general must make the variety discount or outlawed variety program work. Bitter experience has taught us that we must grow the kind of tobacco that is in demand. The fact that tobacco income was dropped so sharply in recent years is proof enough that we must grow the kind of tobacco that is in demand. Here we are with three people from the Department of Agriculture here in Washington. They are particularly interested in the variety discount program as well as the overall tobacco program. I ask them to give us firsthand the situation tobacco is in now and to explain the variety discount program. I think they also might offer some hopes for the future for tobacco. Here's Joe Williams. Joe is director of the Tobacco Division of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He is from Winston-Salem and he knows tobacco. He loves to smoke cigars and he knows how to handle and chew of tobacco. And here's Jim Davids from Yadkin County, just the other side of Winston-Salem. He is field director of the Tobacco Discount Program. He has charge of specialists who go into the field to check on discount varieties. Dr. T.L. Sin is also here. He is the director of the laboratory work in the discount program. I'd like to emphasize that the final identification of varieties is made in the laboratory. There's no guesswork involved. Dr. Sins come from South Carolina. To start with, I would like for Joe to tell us what he thinks of the present tobacco situation. Joe? Senator, I would like first of all to underline what you said about the tobacco revolution. As chairman of the Senate Tobacco Subcommittee, you certainly know what we are up against. The figures you used are impressive, but I want to use a different set that also point up the situation. Last year, we consumed more cigarettes than in any year since 1952, which was a record year. But in spite of this, the nation's tobacco industry actually used 125 million pounds less tobacco than was used in the record year of 1952. In other words, that's what filter tip cigarettes have done to us. Right, Senator. The cigarette industry came forth with the filter tip cigarette to meet the demands of the smoking public. The filter tip cigarette has filled a definite need. It is an ingenious device, and it perhaps saved the overall tobacco industry. But it brought on some very serious problems, particularly to farmers. Filter tips require full-bodied tobacco. You have to have that uh, type of tobacco to penetrate the filter and get the desired taste. At the same time, filter tip cigarettes, as strange as it may seem, 
actually contain about 10% less tobacco than regular cigarettes. Just recently fil filter top boxes have become a pronounced style in smoking. It may be surprising, but cigarettes that are made for filter top boxes have to be smaller than the regular cigarettes in order to fit into a box that will, be, that will work in the vending machine. This means less tobacco for the cigarette. The homogenized tobacco process has also meant the, the use of less natural leaf tobacco in cigarettes. This process utilizes stem and broken particles of tobacco. All these factors, Senator, have brought about drastic changes in the tobacco industry all the way from the farmer on through to the consumer. And they mean, of course, that we have to grow only that tobacco which is in demand. Yes, Senator, and in order to encourage this type of production, support price was cut by 50% last year on three varieties that have many undesirable elements. These varieties were Coca 139, Coca 140, and Dixie Bright 244. A few years ago, these same tobaccos were in demand to some extent, but changes in demand have made them under present condition undesirable. Last year, many farmers, through mixed seed or otherwise, planted the undesirable tobaccos by mistake. It was a serious problem for the entire industry. We are continuing the same program on discount varieties this year, and we sincerely feel that if we can get through this year, then brighter days are ahead for all of us. From my observation of the program during the last year, it would be foolish for a farmer to plant undesirable tobacco. Any farmer who does is kidding no one but himself. Farmers ought to be intimately acquainted with just how the undesirable varieties are distinguished by the department. Now, Jim Davis was brought, has been brought along to, for some illustrations. They show there's no question about identifying the undesirable varieties. Jim? Yes, that's true, Senator. There, each of the discount varieties have certain growth characteristics that uh, makes them easily identifiable in the field. I have four plants here that were grown on a North Carolina experiment station. They were grown under exactly the same growing conditions. They were transplanted the same day. Now this plant is one of our old line varieties, Hicks. The other three are discount varieties. This one is Coca 139. This one is Coca 140, and one on the end is Dixie Bright 244. Now you will notice, Senator, that there are certain obvious differences in these plants. The three discount varieties have a tendency to grow with a heavy leaf growth to the top of the plant. Now you'll notice that's true in each of these cases. Also, another difference is the short distance between the top leaf to the bottom of the flower head. Now that is in direct contrast with our old line variety, which is Higgs. Another uh, thing that gives away the discount varieties is the size and shape of leaf. Now, for example, in the case of Dixie Bright 244, you'll notice this puckered out, the scooping effect, somewhat like a canoe. Also, the leaves are broad, extend all the way out to the edge. Now, this margin and tips of the leaves have a tendency to flop, as you see here. Now, in the case of uh, Coca 139, the leaf, the last third of the leaf, has a tendency to break off abruptly. The way they flop, they look like rabbit dogs here, and I want anything done to my rabbit dog, I'll tell you that. Exactly, Senator. Here is another difference. Is the Veining of the leaf. You'll notice here the angle from the vein to the stem. Its angle is approximately 45 degrees. Now that is only a proof variety. On the discount variety, you will notice that this angle here is approaching a right angle. Now there are other characteristics, Senator, too numerous to mention at this time, that a trained observer can see in the field. From what you said, Jim, the discount varieties have traits that are obvious. But as a double check where there is doubt, 
samples of the tobacco are taken and put through foolproof chemical tests. I want Dr. Sin to tell us exactly how the discount varieties show up in the chemical test. Dr. Sin. Well, Senator, we take samples in the field by taking a plug out of mature leaves. Like plugging a watermelon? And as uh, far as that's concerned, I, I know what plugging a watermelon is. I've done plenty, plenty of that in boyhood days and sometimes at night. And uh, I, I expect Joe Williams here to get mixed up on that. Now, he knows what a plug of tobacco is, as I know it. But just taking it out of green tobacco, I, that's new to me. Well, Senator, we take samples from at least 60 plants in a field where we suspect that there are discount varieties being grown. Now, when we get these samples into the laboratory, there's a rather simple chemical analysis that they undergo. That this gives us the nicotine content, the nitrogen content, and the ratio of nitrogen to nicotine. This analysis is very revealing, and in thousands of cases, there has been no exception to the fact that these discount varieties have a much, much lower nicotine content than do the standard varieties. Now, in fact, these tests show that any of the discount varieties has only a little more than half of the nicotine content that the standard varieties have. Now, Senator, these are scientific facts that have been established in every area of the flu-cured tobacco belt. Actually, Doctor, this relationship is no accident. Now, that is absolutely true, Senator, and I would like to emphasize that these discount varieties were developed to have a low nicotine content, so it is no accident that they show up so clearly when they are taken into the laboratory and given a chemical analysis. In view of the fact discount varieties can be distinguished with certainly both in the field and in the laboratory, I think it's very unwise for any farmer to plant them. I agree with you, Senator, 100 percent. Two, if we expect to increase the consumption of tobacco, we must produce tobacco that is in demand. The buyers of American tobacco overseas who take over a third of our production are insisting more and more on full-bodied tobacco. Prospects are good for steady, though slow, increase in tobacco exports. Recent uptrends in domestic consumption are also very encouraging. These are definite bright spots in the horizon. In the long run, however, I am convinced that increased research is the key to tobacco's future. I mean research in quality control, cheaper production methods, and new markets and new uses for our tobacco. There's no doubt about it, Joe. Basic research has been the bottom of every major advancement tobacco has made. In the past few years, we have been able to greatly increase tobacco research. Friends, time has permitted us to hit only a few of the high spots here today. Do you have any questions on the things we have discussed, write it to me at the Senate Office Building in Washington, D.C., or to Joe Williams here at the Tobacco Division, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington, D.C. Now, I want to thank you very much for all that you've been able to give us on this program.